in the second column of 388, towards the bottom of the column, notice this. We'll see hereafter that synthesis in general, the synthesizing, unifying of our thinking, is the result of what I call the faculty of imagination, a blind but indispensable function of the soul without which we'd have no knowledge whatsoever, but of the existence of which we're scarcely conscious. Imagination necessary for knowledge? Now, look at 389 again, that first big paragraph in the first column. Okay. By means of analysis, different representations are brought under one concept. But how to bring, not representations, but um, the pure synthesis of representations under concepts. Uh, this is what transcendental logic, what he's doing now, means to teach. The first that must be given us a priori for the sake of the knowledge of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition, space and time. The second is the synthesis of the... Okay. Imagination, again. Now, this is a different concept of imagination than we had in Hobbes and Locke. Their imagination was simply having mental images. Okay? Uh, that is to say, the images that stick in your mind, in retention, in memory. The images that you conjure up fictitiously in your mind. Picture images, sense images. That's not what Kant is talking about. He's talking about some imaginative way in which the mind draws everything together into a, a unified field of understanding that may have nothing corresponding to it out there. You see, we create our own organized world. We imagine it. Now, this is the beginning of um, the Romanticist conception of imagination. In the Enlightenment, imagination is simply having sense images. Now it's a creative thing. Building a world, you see, in the mind. Well, as far as Kant is concerned, there are these universal principles which contribute to this building of the unified world in the mind. These categories. Oh, and then more. But at least these categories. So, uh, so keep that uh, in mind, if you... Uh, in mind. I didn't intend that to be a pun. Uh, but keep it there anyway, uh, if you would. Now... Um, that's um, as far as we come then on identifying the categories. Any any question there? Comment? Yeah. Um, okay, you mentioned the Romantics, and if Kant, how did Kant's conception? Where? How did the Romantics? Did the Romantics say that there weren't universal um, categories of the imagination? That would they oh. Um, the Romanticists are not as interested in categories, particularly logical, rational categories. They're interested in the creative resources of the human mind, of the human spirit. Uh, what they add to what Kant does is a reaction against the notion that we're basically rational beings. The notion of the rule of reason, which Kant still holds to is out, you see. We are not ruled by what we know for the Romantics. Uh, the Romantics are emphasizing more that we are emotive beings, uh, feelingful beings, imaginative, creative beings, you see. So Kant is the transitional figure in the sense that one, he's turning away from the view that we are detached spectators, 
remember, uh, to the view that we are creators of our world of experience. Okay. The Copernican Revolution. And two, in um, uh, bringing that sort of change in the way he uses the term imagination, which becomes crucial in the language of Romanticism. Okay? Uh, David? Yes, the forms and categories are both a priori preconditions. That is to say, um, our sense perception simply works in such a way that we structure all the sense impressions spatially, temporally. Now, when you say a space and time in our minds also, well, no, they're not innate ideas or self-evident concepts. No. They're simply functional principles. This is the way the mind functions. So it's not that we start with a concept of space or time. It's rather as you start analyzing the actual way in which you perceive things, you begin to realize that you perceive things spatially and temporally. And say to yourself, now wait a minute, I didn't get that from the raw data. My mind must have contributed that way of doing it. The same with the categories, you see. You don't um, fish through your um, um, checklist of categories in your mind and say to yourself, now let's see, do I want a quantity, quality, relation, or modality category in this case? No, you're not even aware of them, you see. But when you look at the understandings that we have and the structures, of, uh, uh, by looking at the structures, the logical structures of judgments that we make, you realize, no, wait a minute, I don't get those ways of structuring things from experience. <coughs> you see? I don't experience hypotheticals. Um, the hypothetical is the form of judgment that I give. It's my way of interpreting what's going on. And so, um, you only become aware of these in operation. You're aware of them as functioning. And then you stand back and abstract them from that. So the only two forms that we have are space and time. They are forms of sense perception. Now, um, if you understand what Kant's doing, you don't need to stop and tell yourself, I must memorize this, only two forms of space and time. Those are the only two. No, you don't have to tell yourself that. Just look at your own sense perception. <laughs> and you immediately see why he says, only two. Because there are only two. <laughs> you see? Uh, he, he's drawing it from a, uh, an obvious description of the way we perceive things. Okay? We perceive things in spatial relationships. We perceive things in temporal relationships. Ah, got it. <laughs> okay. Um, as far as the other 12 categories go. Yeah. Not the other 12. Or, the 12. Yeah. Um, in, uh, okay, I'm trying to find a way over this. Okay. Kant believes that these have definite bases or definite uses only when there are those intuitions coming into them and then being separated out. Right? Yes, these concepts without percepts are empty. And he says that old-fashioned metaphysics, or the old metaphysics, if it is going to be a science, deals without any of the percepts coming in, right? Yeah. It's only with concepts, and he's yeah. going to analyze whether you can deal just with concepts. If it's the metaphysics of the rationalists and their innate knowledge, it's trying to deal with concepts devoid of percepts. If it's the empiricist dealing only with sense perception, they're trying to deal with percepts without concepts. So when he says concepts without percepts are empty, he's saying to the rationalist, you can't do it. And when he says percepts without concepts are blind, he's saying to the empiricist, you can't do it neither kind of metaphysic works.
Jesus. You cannot have empirical knowledge without interpretive concepts. And you cannot have a priori knowledge without empirical input. I'll put it this way. Um, we, we likened the, um, uh, the forms and categories uh, to a lens. Um, do you see a lens? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, you, you see through a lens. <laughs> and you only realize you have the lens um, and are using the lens when you're without it. You see. So um, it's not that you're conscious of the lens. It doesn't hang heavily on your nose the way spectacles do. You're just not conscious of it. Okay, does that help? Um, yeah, so try to avoid saying, you were talking about groping for the words, try to avoid saying that the forms and categories are innate. In Plato's sense, they're not. In Descartes' sense, they're not. In Leibniz's sense, they're not. Yes, I Try to avoid saying the learned, because in the usual sense of learning by experience, they're not. They may be recognized and identified in the course of experience, uncovered. Okay. But they're spotted in operation by functioning. Yeah. Carl? Well, is it there? How do we know comparatively if it is there? If we can't go, I mean, the lens is always filtered out of perception. How do we know that? Yeah. What is lens and what is lens? Yeah, well, I think the answer is go back to Hume. And without such a lens, like the concept of cause and effect. Can you know any matters of fact beyond present experience? No. Your percepts without the concept of cause and effect are blind. You can't know anything, can't see a thing. So everything gets it's self evident that we can't prove that something has a lens. Why? That, that is self evident. That is, that is a priori, but it's not. No. 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 Um, now, for the moment, um, well, let me come back to your first question. Your first question is, how do we know the lens is there if you can't see it? Uh, to which the simple answer is, they're not empirical objects. And the more sophisticated answer is, don't you remember what Hume told you? Yes, sir. Hume told you that Without the lens of the cause and effect conception, you can't know a thing beyond present experience. Um, now, what was the second question? That being the case, um, how, do we, how do we separate out what is lens and what is, or what is By the transcendental method. Okay. That is to say, you try and catch it in the act. How do you do that? Well, in the case of sense perception, you uh, bracket out, eliminate all particulars of sense experience, all particular qualities and so forth, and ask what's left. And you find space-time forms. 